Reviews for Harry and Meghan's big budget Netflix series have so far been less than kind. Unimaginative and frustrating, said Hollywood's Bible Variety magazine. So sickening, I almost brought up my breakfast, said the woke Bible The Guardian. All the intimacy of Instagram, sneered the normally timid New York Times. A nauseating self-serving snooze fest, said another pundit. Well, that was me, actually. Now, against this deluge of derision, Netflix today released a new trailer for the second half of this compelling series, which comes out on Thursday. Viewer discretion is advised. This clip contains weapons-grade hypocrisy. I wonder what would have happened to us had we not got out when we did. Our security was being pulled. Everyone in the world knew where we were. I said that we need to get out of here. We are on the freedom flight. <laughs> to see this institutional gaslighting. But I wasn't being thrown to the wolves. I was being fed to the wolves. They were actively recruiting people to disseminate disinformation. They were happy to lie to protect my brother. They were never willing to tell the truth to protect us. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. The rogue royals. They just wanted to be free. They wanted to be free to love and be happy. I applauded that. In order for us to be able to move to the next chapter, you've got to finish the first chapter. It gave us a chance to create that home that we had always wanted. I've always felt as though this was a fight worth fighting for. Institutional gaslighting, says Harry. Do you think he even knows what that means? They were happy to lie to protect my brother. Who? The royals? Me? The media? Who is it? The irony is earth-shattering, isn't it? Harry and Meghan are the Duke and Duchess of gaslighting themselves. The entire show is a cynical attempt to manipulate viewers into questioning their own recollections of reality. And if we learned anything at all from the first three hours of this $100 million wine-a-thon, it's surely that this dismal duo wouldn't know the truth if it smacked them around their smug chops. Let's look at their truth versus the actual truth. Meghan moans that royal advisers forced her to uninvite her dear niece, Ashley, from the wedding, the only member of her family that she seemed to be still talking to. How do we explain that this half-sister isn't invited to the wedding, but that the half-sister's daughter is? And so, with Ashley, the guidance at the time was to not have her come to our wedding. <laughs> Yeah, that was a lie. Impeccably placed royal sources told the Sunday Times no such guidance was ever given. And that was supposed to be the show's big example of how Meghan really cares very deeply about her family, so deeply that only one member of that family was at the wedding, her mother, not even her favourite little niece, Ashley. Meghan also sees she got no advice on royal protocol, forcing her to learn how to be a princess all on her own. Joining this family, I knew that there was a protocol for how things were done. There's no class in some person who goes sit like this, cross your legs like this, use this fork, don't do this, curtsy then, wear this kind of hat. The doesn't happen. Another lie. And by the way, Megan, if you don't like me calling you a liar, just sue me and we'll go through all this in court. The Sunday Times discovered she was actually handed a 30-point dossier, studiously researched, brimming with information and contacts. Meghan later simpers that she never wore bright colours to show respect, because she's all about respect. So I was like, well, what's a colour that they'll probably never wear? Camel, beige, white. So I wore a lot of muted tones, but it also was so I could just blend in. Like, I'm not trying to stand out here. No, the last thing Meghan Markle would ever want to do is stand out. But it's all another lie. Photos taken by the evil, bigoted British press show her wearing pretty much every colour in the rainbow. The show opens with a claim that the royal family declined to comment on the series. That's another lie. The palace says it received one email from an unknown company and attempts to verify it were flatly ignored. Even the story of their romance and engagement Turns out to be in a series of whoppers. They told the BBC in 2017 they were set up by a mutual friend on a blind date. They told Netflix they met on Instagram. And what about Harry's modest proposal in their humble cottage kitchen? Uh, it happened uh, a few weeks ago, mm. um, earlier this month, here at, at our cottage. Um, just a standard, typical it's night a for us. It's a cosy night. It was 
what we're doing, just roasting chicken roasting and having chicken. <laughs> trying to roast a chicken. <laughs> trying to roast a chicken. And it was just, a, uh, just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet. An amazing surprise. It was so sweet. Well, according to Netflix, which is their show, it was actually a candlelit extravaganza in their walled garden. And Megan was so amazingly surprised, she managed to figure out what was happening and tell her friend about it before Harry even popped the question. A small little detail, but rather like their claim, or Meghan's claim, that they'd been secretly married by the Archbishop of Canterbury in their garden before, three days before, the big televised wedding, which also turned out not just to be untrue, but had it been true, would have led to the Archbishop of Canterbury being incarcerated in prison. As with all things Meghan, and Harry, it would seem, the truth just doesn't really exist in their world. It's their truth, their version of it. Meghan also lambasted the entire BBC engagement interview as rehearsed and an orchestrated reality show, because that's the last thing she'd be engaging in, isn't it? An orchestrated reality show, like the Netflix series. Michelle Hussein from the BBC, who carried out the interview, said, actually, no, it was just an interview. Even the BBC's long-serving royal correspondent, Nicholas Witchell, normally bent double to avoid upsetting absolutely anybody in royal circles, can't take it anymore. Consider one of the things that Meghan said. No matter what I did, they were still going to find a way to destroy me. Well, the first point, who is the they that she's referring to? I think it is the palace, but most particularly it is to the press. But the idea that anyone was out to destroy her frankly, I think, is absurd and simply does not stand up to proper and reasonable scrutiny. Well, that's Nicholas Witchell's way of saying you're lying. And he's right. They lie all the time. Nothing they ever say seems to stand up to reasonable scrutiny. And I say that as somebody who lost his last job presenting Good Morning Britain because I wouldn't apologise for saying I didn't believe Meghan Markle. Think about that. Well, just like they've failed to ever provide a shred of evidence for their claims of racism in the palace or Meghan's claims over mental health problems, she said that they were not just ignored by the palace, but she was told she wasn't allowed to get any help for suicidal thoughts by somebody at the palace. Who was that person? They shouldn't be working at the palace. We've never had a name. Like, we've never had any names about the racism. Today's new trailer makes clear that the gloves are off in the next three episodes of the show. And remember, this is just a warm-up. Then there's Harry's book coming in early January. Hundreds of pages of more allegations about his family. There will be mudslinging, incendiary claims, bombshells, and, I fear, a lot more lies. And on behalf of the British people and the monarchy they're trashing, I intend to call out every single lie that they utter in their attempt to not just destroy the royal family, but to potentially bring down the British monarchy. Well, joining me now is the organiser of Black Lives Matter protests, Iman Aiton, former head of royal protection, Di Davis, and Talk TV presenter Sharon Osborne over in Los Angeles. Sharon, great to have you on the programme. Um, I don't know about you, I got about halfway through the first instalment of this wine thon last Thursday and felt genuinely nauseous. I mean, I could feel vomit rising inside me, but also a sense of tedium. Like, we'd heard all this before with Oprah. Uh, nothing really seemed that new. It was just a new gloss put on all this stuff, but the main purpose of it just seemed to be to attack the royal family, to attack the institution of the monarchy, to attack Britain as a racist country. What, what do you make of all this? It was all very distasteful, Piers. I was totally bored by the whining, the whining, the whining. And, you know, the curtsy, the thing she said about medieval times, her lunch with the Queen was like medieval times, which, as you know, is a Disney-type um, entertainment place for kids. And it's just so horribly disrespectful and just a wine fest. I mean, is the book going to be the same thing? Whining, whining, is there going to be no positive points? And that whole thing of him... Um, 
filming himself on the Freedom Flight, mm. they must have had that deal with Netflix done months right. before they ever left. So and the whole thing was a setup, a setup, a setup. Why, unless you had a deal, why would you have done that filming of yourself on the plane and all of that? And also, what kind doing of freedom? Doing a video diary, what? Yeah, and what kind of freedom is it if all you're doing is living in your California mansion with uh, unbelievable privilege and wealth and you're signing all these deals with companies who want their pound of flesh and that pound of flesh is exclusively trashing your family? I mean, this is all they do. From the Oprah interview onwards, but all they've done it, is trash their families. Onwards is trash. But there's nothing about themselves, you know, and this is a great time for them to keep talking about their charity. But no, it's about them being these poor little children who are so much in love and how abused they've been. Their race, the way they act, everything has been, you know, abused by the public, by the press, by the royal family. Well, do you know what? You've got a great life. You've got a beautiful family. You're so much in love. Move on. Get a life. Move yeah. on. And they just can't seem to because their living is by telling their truth on the royal family. That's how they make their living. Yeah. Um, Through their truth, as they yeah, say. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, Di Davis, on the question of their security specifically, because you were obviously responsible for a lot of royal security for many years, Harry claims that they were sort of had their security all taken away. Is that even remotely likely to have been true? Well, no, the answer is absolutely not. The uh, protection team followed them to Canada. It was when they moved from Canada to the United States, somebody far higher than I in my present role or my old role decided, along with a committee that decides this called RABAC, um, they decided that it was no longer sustainable for British police officers to continue. And I totally and utterly agreed. And can I say, the last time you and I spoke, we were talking about the lies that Uncle, um, his uncle Andrew mm. put across. And here we are again, as an investigator, as you rightly have said, and many others, there are so much inconsistencies in this. There are so many half-truths. And my concern is, as I said, having had some information from Texas, as to the number of individuals there who have uh, believed this hook, line and sinker. Yeah. And if you know your history of attacks on the royal family as I do, then you would start to realise this is potentially very serious indeed, not only for the royal family, but for a fixated person on either side to get in touch and cause, as it did with President Reagan, mm. as it did with Her Majesty a Queen last Christmas, a man with a crossbow, etc., etc., Every year, over a 1,000 referrals are made to the Fixated Threat Assessment Centre. Most of them are harmless, but amongst them there is a hard core who could pose serious risk. And that's what I've been concerned about as a consequence of this nonsense that's been spewed out by these two and some of their supporters. Yeah, I completely agree. OK, look, Imane, we've had some... A lot of, you know, animated debate about this, and I completely respect a lot of the stuff that you've been saying. Vice versa. Uh, my, my issue with this is I, I'm not sure what the supposed end game is or how much more of this was supposed to stomach. I mean, this is another three hours of trashing coming on Thursday, then the book, then a series of interviews around the book. This is just a never-ending stream of attacks on their own family. I appreciate that's how you feel, but ultimately what they're really doing is highlighting the disgusting elephant in the room that the majority of this nation are more than happy to ignore. And that's what's happening right now. And they're trying to do it in a way that allows them to look after their family, basically. So if it means making money whilst they do it, then so well, What is that elephant in the room? Racism. Racism in terms of racial prejudice within an institution and racism in terms of this country being racist. But I said to you the other day, when things got a bit heated yeah. uh, at this desk, that I felt that if you're going to make incredibly serious charges of racism in an institution like the British royal family and the monarchy, you've got to provide some evidence. They've now had a year and a half or more since mm. the Oprah Winfrey interview in which they made all these incendiary claims. They've not produced any evidence of any racism. OK, so what I'm hoping is that 
these next set of documentaries, they will actually provide us with some names so we can kind of stop discussing what if it doesn't? and going. If it doesn't, well, what I'll do is I'll provide you with my evidence. Is that all right? If you give me a minute, I'll give you some evidence as to why this, that specific institution is racist, which I can do. So, in terms of the evidence that you are likely to find, it is going to be in the form of covert racism. And I know you don't like that word, but it, it is a fact. So, examples include, in terms of the institution, the distribution of the Order of St. Michael, which is a badge which ultimately depicts a white man with wings trampling a black man. We can also delve into the fact that uh, that institution hung up pictures of a little black slave boy on the walls within the institution, and everyone was so blinded by their racial prejudice that no one saw fit to take it down when the black president popped round for tea. Or we can delve into the fact that the Queen Elizabeth, or rather the late Queen, made sure that she did not have to adhere to the equalities laws and legislation, which is arguably what a true racist would do. And we cannot take away the fact... You're, calling the, fact, you're calling the late second. Queen a true racist? No, I'm saying it's arguably what a true racist would do, to well, make sure... She was the head of the second. Commonwealth. Hold she couldn't have been a less racist person okay. if she had tried. Okay. Ask Piers. anyone in any of the Commonwealth countries Piers. about the Queen. None of them ever felt the Queen was a racist. Yes. And when you say things like that, you lose me. I'm like... That's a, that's a ridiculous thing to say. OK, so I'll explain it. So, racism was the building blocks for the transatlantic slave trade, a trade that was funded by the royal family, and they ultimately made their wealth off of the blood, sweat and tears off of enslaved and Africans. And it was this country... And, hold on a second. It was this country that actually led the end of slavery. Which everyone likes to talk about. Hundreds of years ago, also, by the way. But you also contributed to it. And what you fail to realise is that the legacy of colonialism and slavery and British politeness play mm. a vital role in the perpetuation of covert racism, in other words, the present-day racism that I talk about today, which is in the form of covert racism. So would you just... So you've described the late Queen as a, a, effectively a true racist. Arguably. You think, and you think the country is racist? OK, so if anyone that doesn't think that this country is racist... No, no, are afraid, we a racist a country? So I'm going to Or are we it. a country that actually is remarkably tolerant, has extraordinarily multicultural society, but includes some racist people? Okay, Which so one is you, it? So if you don't think this is a racist country, you should probably speak to Diane Abbott, the black footballers who have to contend with racism on a daily basis, or we can delve into the 85,000 people who... So you're saying because a few people... people... Can I just finish? Yeah. Please? Or we can delve into the 85,000 people who reported racially motivated hate crimes in 2021 and it's subsequently gone up to 100,000. Right. Or we can delve into the 120,000 people who have left their jobs in the last five years due to racism. Or we can delve into the quarter of staff and 56% of students within higher education that have to contend with racism. Or if none of those are acceptable, you, I can happily okay. show you my plethora me just, of messages if I, I receive after this interview. I have no... I do not dispute for a moment there are vile racists in this country. I don't dispute for a moment. If you trawl enough on social media, you'll find them. But I do think they are the ugly little barnacles peering out from rocks. I don't believe that they are actually what this country stands for. But I don't believe the vast majority of people in Britain are racist. I don't think we're an institutionally racist country. And I certainly don't think the Queen had a racist bone in her body, which is why she's such a beloved figure in the Commonwealth. So can I just add that... Again, I said it to you last time, this country has a very rudimentary understanding of racism, often referring to overt racism as the defining factor for racism. The problem with covert be, racism... That couldn't be even more... Right, but the problem with covert racism is you end up with people like Meghan Markle mm. who say, I was a victim of racism, but don't feel they have any compulsion to have to say what actually happened, when it happened and who said it. And that is... If that's covert racism, the problem with it is there's no hard fact to support it. But that's the issue with... OK, so firstly, I will preface my statement by saying I agree with you. It should be known. That's, that's mm. a fact. It should be known and she should make a point of saying it. I really do hope that she does. But... Ultimately, like I said, this is about her highlighting a truth, a truth that many people are failing to acknowledge. And like I All said... All right, let me bring, let me bring back Sharon. A, an odd frame of reference. Let me bring back Sharon. Sharon. Sharon, look, these are pretty incendiary comments from Iman here, that we are a racist country, that the Queen effectively was a true covertly, racist. Covertly. Covertly. Covertly or otherwise. Uh, I mean, I find those comments pretty offensive. What do you think? I think that, as in... Every country in this world, there are a sect that are anti-Semitic racist. There always will be, no matter what, there always will be because there's good and bad in every race. There's always a little group of these nasty little evil people that dislike someone because of colour or religion. Those are the two main dislikes. So, yes, there is a certain... Um, minority in England that are very racist and are very anti-Semitic.
okay? And I can say that being a Jew. So the thing is, it's never going to end. It hasn't ended for thousands of years. Why should it end now? But you carry on. You don't give these people a platform. You want to talk about somebody with a platform, Kanye West. Mm. He is, he has millions of followers that follow him, that adore him and will do what he wants them to do. You see, I but actually think, I actually is, think look, Meghan Markle... The country isn't overall racist. No, and I think Meghan Markle branding as a racist country and attacking the institution of the monarchy is racist. It's unfair. I think, I think it's actually, unfair. I think she totally is, unfair. she is what I would call a race beta. If she doesn't produce hard evidence to support these incendiary claims, she becomes a race beta exploiting racism and the issue of racism to act as a kind of protective shield around her and to make herself extremely rich and famous as a professional victim. Last word to Di Davis. Di, just as somebody who has been around the royal family for many, many years, how do you feel about the way the reputation of the royal family is being so traduced in this way? Well, I'm appalled, frankly. Uh, some people see racism around the corner. Uh, racism is in Africa, it's in India, it's in every continent. And so to pick on the royal family in this way is both insulting, it's also insulting. Most of the media are very decent people. I know a huge amount of people for the last 50 odd, odd years in the media. Just like you and I are decent people. To vilify both the royals, the media and the nation and somehow imply we're all racist is nonsensical, in my opinion. And I, I, I just despair that there are so many who will take the word of proven liars and then translate it into this issue about racism. And you were around the Queen a lot on this suggestion that she was some covert racist herself. What do you say to that? Unbelievable nonsense. Thank you, Di. Appreciate you joining me. Thank you, Sharon, uh, over there in LA. Hope to catch up with you soon. Thank you, Mom, Thank for joining you. me. I appreciate it.